so thankful that you joined us this evening. Hopefully, you had practice this morning. At least tonight, you'll be able to run through the rain. Right? Amen. All right. Uh, it is coming down, but thank the Lord we need the rain. Let's stand. Let's open our service by singing. This is the day. This is the day. We are having a ladies' lunch. Okay, that is at 12 o'clock. You're marching yet. Yeah, march. <laughs> See, that's, that's why they don't ask me to do the announcements. <laughs> April, May. Yes. All right. So May thirteenth. Let's rewind and start over. May the thirteenth at twelve o'clock. Okay, we're having a ladies' lunch. We're calling it Garden Party. 
All right, so lady says what we need you to do, two things. Number one, we do need you to sign up. It's very important, so we know how much food to prepare, how much food to have, how many tables and things to set up. But we want you to invite someone, someone who maybe uh, a neighbor, a friend, somebody who, who has never heard the gospel, or someone who's not saved, because they will hear the gospel message there. There'll be a time of singing, there'll be some special music, a good time of fellowship, and they will hear the gospel presentation. So invite someone to come out, but we do need you to please sign up. Um, and so there is a sign up sheet out there for us. So if you can help us out with that, that's from 12 to 2 on May the 13th. Um, <laughs> the second Monday of each month, beginning on May the 8th, uh, we're going to have a time of praying for our nation. And we need to pray for our nation. Um, there's a lot of things that you know we do uh, to stand for right and stand for the truth. But there, I don't believe there's anything greater that we can do than to pray. Um, you know, we, we need to be on our knees in prayer and ask God to intervene for our nation. Um, our nation keeps, seems like it keeps turning and further and further away. But you know what? God can change the heart of the nation. Okay. And so on May the 8th and every se second Monday of each month between 11 and 12 o'clock at Art and Pam's owner's home, uh, but they will be having a time of prayer. So if you're able to be there, I know some of us work, but if you're able to be there um, to pray, uh, you, if you have any questions, you can give, give them a call. Their phone number and address is in the uh, bulletin. So great time. If you can't be there, you say, hey, listen, I got to work. I can't be there. Listen, think about it. Put it on your calendar. Just take time to pray on your own. Um, and that's a good, a good thing to be praying for our nation. Nursery workers are needed. If you're a member of, of the church and you're willing to serve in the nursery uh, with another worker, please contact and see Pat Cohaney. She can help you out with that. Uh, so please help us out with that. The 2023 Couples Retreat is coming up. Put it on your calendar, October the 12th through the 14th at Bird in Hand, Pennsylvania. Great time of instruction, fellowship, have some fun, but good foundational solid instruction for uh, the home, for couples, for marriages. So please plan on being there for that. Um, baptisms are coming up on May the 21st. So if you've been saved and not been baptized, uh, please see either myself, or you can see Pastor Weigel, and we would love to get you set up for baptism. That is on Sunday, May the 21st, and that's it. No more announcements, no more months, no more nothing. All right, let's stand and let's continue singing. Let's sing on all the winning side. You know, what I remember the most about this song, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this video, but Curtis Hudson, great evangelist from years ago, towards the end of his life, he had gotten very sick. But there's a video out there. If you haven't got a chance to watch it, you should watch it. Watch it. He sang this song. His voice was failing him. He got out there, and with all that he had in him, he sang, I'm on the winning side. And listen, no matter what may come our way, if we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we can rejoice and sing, I am on the winning side. Let's stand and sing. Once I drifted out and sing, and no hope nor joy within, and my soul was burning down.
Lord, thank you so much, Lord, that we have the great privilege of proclaiming the gospel, of being a light, being, being the salt. And Lord, help us, help us to be that light. Help us to put aside all worldliness, and Lord, help us to live for you, Lord, and you alone. We pray that you would bless us this evening, Lord. Bless Pastor as he preaches the word. And we pray that you would bless this offering. Use it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. former treaties have a made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he had, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles, whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, he hath, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of, to Israel? 
And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times and, or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after the, that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so show, I'm sorry, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Uh, we pray for the Hendricksons, Lord, you to comfort them. Uh, just give them that sweet peace that passes all understanding as we re they rejoice in uh, their beloved uh, one going up into heaven and uh, uh, being able to come into the presence of Christ. And we're, we're thankful that uh, we can uh, know them uh, and to be able to be involved in their lives and certainly be able to rejoice and the hope of eternal life. And God, we pray for your blessings and your sweet peace at this time. We do pray, Lord, that you might be with the preaching of the word of God tonight, uh, that we might be able to really uh, understand a great challenge that is given in this chapter, be able to see uh, really uh, how God uh, commands us, instructs us, and it helps us, Lord, to be able to do the work of the ministry and being able to, to effectively reach a world that is dying uh, without Christ, without hope. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd just speak to us in a special way this evening. I would pray if there's anyone in the building that's not saved, that you'd touch them, they would come to know Christ as their Savior. Certainly, we're mindful of those that are watching online right now. I pray if anyone is watching that's not saved, now, God, they might contact us. We could help be a help to them and share the scriptures that they can uh, turn their heart to Christ. And so bless now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text verse is verse 2. It says, Unto the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Parting instruction. Uh, Jesus is giving instruction to his disciples after he rose out of the grave prior to his ascension into heaven and through the Holy Spirit power he was giving commandments to them because he had called them and chose them to do a good great work in establishing the church of Jesus Christ the book of Acts is a great book uh, it really is when you study through it you find out that the, uh, the author of the book of Acts is Luke because of verse 1 it says the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. You read Luke chapter 1 and verse 3, and you see Luke's putting his signature on the gospel of Luke as he writes it to Theophilus. And so we see very clearly the, the author of the gospel of Luke and the author of the book of Acts are the same person uh, is Luke. Now, Acts is, uh, really records for us the history, the early history, if we will, of the church. And uh, it's a historical book, and uh, it's not a book that could be used for doctrinal foundations, but rather there's doctrine in the book, but it is specifically a book of history. It's a book that records for us the beginning of the church and the process through which it grew and experienced a move of God. So Acts is what we would identify as a historical book where many churches get themselves in trouble doctrinally is they run to the book of Acts to get their foundational doctrinal truths and uh, instead of going to the book of Romans. Amen. Romans is your doctrinal foundation. Acts is your historical information. And so the, where they get into trouble, they don't realize that the book of Acts is a transitional book. Everything in the book of Acts is changing. Uh, first of all, in the Gospels, we basically see Jesus uh, presenting a kingdom message because Jesus came to his own. That was the Jew. 
and he came to present them uh, to present himself as their king and as their messiah and so we see everything focused on a kingdom message however in the book of acts everything's focused on the church so it's two different things going on as far as the emphasis we also see acts as a transitional book because we see everything is centered in Jerusalem. But then all of a sudden you'll find that as Paul goes out on his missionary journeys and as he'll return, he'll re return to Antioch to report what God was doing. And they were first called Christians in Antioch. So the emphasis and the focus is not just transitioning from a kingdom message to Israel to a, a, a ministry of the church but it's a transitional book in that it's moving its center of importance from Jerusalem to Antioch and then also the characters that are the main characters uh, in the Gospels and then in the uh, beginning of the, of, uh, the book of Acts uh, Peter is your head leader of the church uh, he is one that was the head leader of the twelve uh, disciples and uh, but now when you get to Acts chapter 9 and uh, Acts chapter 10 you see a transition going on to where the emphasis is from Peter being the main character and leader but rather the Apostle Paul is so everything in the book of Acts is transitioning uh, and by the time you get to the end of the book of Acts you actually have the church in full swing, functioning and operating according to the epistles that were given to them by the different apostles. And so at the very beginning of this great historical book of Acts, we have Luke presenting to us this thought process uh, that Jesus Christ through the Holy Ghost was giving commandments unto his apostles whom he had chosen. And so that's why I call this parting instruction. Jesus is getting ready to ascend up into heaven and he's just reminding, and uh, Luke is reminding the uh, 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 believers and specifically the disciples, the apostles, uh, what Jesus was instructing them to do. So parting instruction. First of all, I see this, there needs to be a remembered work in verse one and two. The former treaties, I have I made O Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. He's reminding them to remember the work of Christ. He's reminding them to remember the words of Christ. And uh, the reality is they remember everything that Jesus said uh, up to the day that he ascended into heaven uh, because he gave commandments to them to do so. And I just thought about a remembered work I think we need to remember the work of the church is seeking the lost. In uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, we know Jesus, the Son of Man, came into this world to do what? To seek and to save that which is lost. And I think sometimes what we do is we uh, forget uh, what the main emphasis is of the church. The emphasis of the church is not entertainment and is not fellowship. It is soul winning. Amen. Uh, it is seeking the lost. And we have to remind ourselves of that constantly because of the fact it's easy to, to slumber and to sleep and to lay back and get comfortable with things and in the process forget that there's people around us that need to be saved. Amen. And the amazing thing is, is I, I remember a preacher years ago I was at a preacher's meeting and this preacher said, well, you know, he said, you have to understand as we're these all preachers were there. He said this, he said, the, the reality is, is that as pastors, we're always in our office and we're always dealing with Christians and we're always uh, uh, discipling people and running the church and all this, that, and the other, but we don't get around sinners. <laughs> I, thought, I, I thought to myself, now I was a young guy. I just started out ministry. And these are all guys that have been in ministry for 20, 25 years. And I thought it was not my place to speak up and say something. Right. And uh, But it bothered my heart. I thought to myself, well, if you're not getting around sinners, then get out of your office and go out. There's a whole lot of sinners out there, amen? And I think we won't do that unless we are willing to remind ourselves of what the call of God is upon us. What is the call of God upon the church? 
And so that we need to remember what the work of Christ is in seeking the lost. It is sending the gospel. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, we're supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel of every creature. And you say, preacher, I know that. Yes, I know that we have know that, but we have a tendency to allow ourselves to be comfortable with the status quo. Uh, not investing more money in missions or not sending out more missionaries or not having an emphasis on missions. I just know this, it's always a challenge uh, for me as a pastor uh, to make sure that we keep the emphasis in the right place. Because you can get, I, I'll tell you, when you have a Christian school and you have church ministry and you got all this stuff going on. I mean, yesterday we had a volleyball game here in the morning. We had in the afternoon a piano recital in the afternoon. And you just think of all the stuff that goes on all week long. And then church ministry is getting ready for ladies so, uh, luncheon and all this. Uh, it is easy to lose sight of the reality of what we're supposed to be about. What is the main emphasis? And it's not only a challenge for the pastor, it's a challenge for the church members to keep the main thing the main thing. I have found over the years when people become disgruntled with the church, it is because of the fact that they have lost the vision of what the church is supposed to be. Because of the fact what they do is they start getting upset because of other minor issues that really are not significant issues in reference to how the church is the function or what the church is supposed to be doing. They get caught up in that and they get offended because they don't feel those minor issues are being met in their life. And then what do they do? They leave the church. And when they leave the church, what happens to them? They, do they get involved in soul winning and, and ministry and discipleship in another church? No. And so it all funnels back to this matter of remembering what the work of the church is. And Jesus reminded the believers about that, and specifically the apostles. So remember the work, seeking the lost, sending the gospel, and securing the believers. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, is that ye henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro with carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And so we need to be secure in our faith. We need to know what we believe. We need to know why we believe it. And we need to be unwilling to compromise on what we believe. And because there's all kinds of foolishness that is going on uh, in churches today, and certainly in the world and in Christianity in general uh, that is going on in reference to what the work of God is. And so right off the bat, as we see to, uh, uh, Luke sending this letter to, to Theophilus, he's reminding him of the work that Jesus Christ began to do. And he reminded him that we need to uh, have that focus and that emphasis. So as you see, we need to remember the work. In verse 3, where we read, I see there is a revealed message. Notice in verse 3, it says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. The revealed message of Christ. He is revealing, once again, through many infallible proofs of who he is and that he was crucified, dead, buried, and rose again. And he's doing that specifically because of the lie of the wicked. Amen. The devil Amen. was always ready to lie. We know the plot that was laid out when Jesus was crucified, how they plotted and planned to be able to give a story that his disciples came and stole the body of Christ away and all that. Listen, the message we have is always attacked by the devil. Amen. The message that we have to share that Jesus saves and God, because God loves man is always corrupted. And so we have to allow Christ to reveal to us who he is. And not only that, but reveal to others as we share who Christ is with them to remind them of the message that Jesus Christ gave to us. So the lie of the wicked. There's the eyewitness of the tomb. 
And uh, certainly when uh, they were going to replace uh, Judas, one of the qualifications uh, in order to be listed with the apostles was that they had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection of Christ. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 22 it says, being from the baptism, beginning in the, from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of the resurrection. And so the message that has to be revealed had to be one that was true, one that was trustworthy, one that was accurate, one that was just. And the only way that they could fulfill that, uh, all those demands on the message to be revealed was they had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's people today in different churches will say they're apostles. They're not apostles because none of them can fit the qualification to be an eyewitness of the resurrection of Christ. And so uh, we have a message to reveal. Christ was very careful and very systematic in revealing who he is and what he did and how he defeated death uh, to his disciples. And then we just see the confirmation of the apostle Paul. He was aware of the fact he identifies himself as one born out of due season in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 8. And acknowledging the fact that he was an eyewitness on the Damascus road of Jesus Christ and his resurrected body. And so we have a revealed message. We, let's just remind ourselves of the work of Christ and be committed to revealing that message that Jesus Christ is alive. Amen. There is no other religion throughout history or in the world that we are living in right now, no other religion whose founder has been crucified, buried, and rose again. And so the message we have is one of hope because of the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. So I see a remembered work. I see a revealed message. And then in verse 4 and 5, I see an assured promise. Notice in verse 4, he says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the fire, uh, I'm sorry, with the Holy Ghost not many days uh, hence. And um, I'm getting to the end of my first point before I even get to it. Amen. <laughs> Assured promise. The promise is the fire of the Holy Ghost. In uh, Luke chapter 3 and verse 16, John acknowledges the fact that the one that would be coming, he was not worthy to undo or unlatch his, his shoe. Uh, however, he said this, he will baptize you with the fire of the Holy Ghost. And I think of, of the assured promise of God that you and I can be filled with the Spirit of God. We can experience the fire of God in our life. And I think we have lost that. I, I, uh, uh, I, I preached out at, at uh, Keswick a few weeks ago. I had a good time preaching out there. Of course, I always enjoy preaching. And uh, I was out there and a couple of guys uh, talked to me afterwards. And uh, one guy came up to me and told me, he said this. He said, we get a lot of teaching out here, but we don't get any fire like that I heard tonight. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I said, well, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. But God has promised he would fill us with the fire of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And we need some fire, Holy Ghost anointing on the people of God in 2023. Amen. Where God's fire comes down from heaven uh, and ignites a burning and a conviction through the preaching of the Word of God. So that's your next point, Jack. I switched the wording all around. You don't know where I'm at. Amen. <laughs> the preaching that burns with conviction. I, I, I like the men on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection of Christ. Uh, they're, they're very distraught about everything that had taken place. Jesus comes alongside and starts talking with them. And uh, they're not aware of that is Jesus Christ. But after he breaks bread with them and eats with them and he departs from them, the response of the men on the road to Emmaus was this. Did not our hearts burn within us? And when he revealed the scriptures to us. I'm talking about old-fashioned preaching that burns with conviction. 
And uh, when I was in Bible college, Dr. Malone always told us, men, preach for people to make a decision. And I don't preach just to tell a story up here. I don't preach just to be able to have fun and jump around and yell and holler. I preach because I want the people who are hearing the message to get under the conviction of God because of what the Word of God has said. And that will only take place by the fullness and the power of the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. So the short prophet, he promised he would fill us with power. Right. He promised he would send his Holy Spirit. Then let's live within the realm of the assured promises of God. I see not only fire of the Holy Ghost and preaching that burns with conviction, but I see prayer that purifies the heart. Uh, you know, Psalm 66 and 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Uh, we need a prayer that purifies the heart. If we confess our faults, he's faithful and just forgive us. Our, if we, we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Prayer that purifies the heart. Uh, and, you know, I was a student uh, this past week, and uh, was, uh, I think it was on Thursday, you know, kids, if there's any paint that's ready to peel, they'll peel the paint. And uh, we've, been, we've been having a problem with that every once in a while. But anyway, this little boy, first grader, came to me, and what his teacher brought him to me and said this. So uh, he admitted he'd been pulling the paint off the wall. I was like, uh, okay. So I looked at him. I said, let's go in the office and talk about this a little bit. So I took him in the office. And I was like, why did, why did you peel paint off the wall? He said, I don't know. I just felt like I wanted to. <laughs> I told him, I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. You do something like that again, you're going to be in bad trouble. And I mean serious trouble. And I said, I want you to tell your mom and dad what you did. I said, but since you came to me confessing your sin, as in James chapter 4 says, we're to confess our faults one towards another. I said, 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if God can cleanse you and God can forgive you, and uh, then I can too. I said, let's pray. And I prayed together with him and asked the Lord to help him. And, and he gave me a little note. And uh, it was a funny little note, typical first grader, how he wrote on there. And uh, he just gave me a note and said, Pastor Weibel, I'm so sorry I peeled the paint off the wall. He told me he'd paint the wall if I wanted to. <laughs> oh, man, you try to deal with these kids. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting old and soft in my age. <laughs> but anyway, he said, I, I, I'd paint the wall if you want me to. I said, no, you don't have to paint the wall. I just don't want you to peel it off anymore. <laughs> and so he gave me his note, Pastor Weibel, I'm sorry I, I peeled the paint off the wall. Uh, I thank you so much for praying with me. <laughs> I was like, how can I discipline this kid? <laughs> you say, what are you saying? I'm just saying this. There's a first grader who learned the purifying perfection of God. If we pray and confess our faults, God will forgive us and he'll cleanse us. Amen. And we can go on to be a testimony of the power of God to work in our life. And so he assured them of the promise of God that he would send the Holy Spirit upon them and they could be pure in their hearts. There is the practice that preserves true Christian conduct. And so we're assured of the promises of God. I don't know about you. It makes it easier for me to live the Christian life when I'm confident in what God has promised to me. And certainly there's so many promises in reference to God giving us rewards for our labors for his glory. And so it enables us to be able to go on in our Christian life. So there's a remembered work, a revealed message, an assured promise, and then verse 6 through 8, an energized testimony. And uh, verse 6 says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he, uh, he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. It's energized testimony. 
Notice, first of all, they were willing to move from questions to action. And I think we need to be reminded about that. There may be some things that we may have questions about that God may not give us answers about, but he answers the questions that we have in light of the reality of his kingdom and his timing. And so when we, they're, they're asking, when is the kingdom going to be restored? He says, it's not for you to know that. He, what does he say? You just need to get on with the work. Yeah. And, and oftentimes people say, well, I just don't understand what God is doing. You don't have to understand everything that God is doing. You just need to have a testimony that's energized and empowered by the reality that God is going to work his will in your life, irregardless of whether he reveals everything to you Amen. or not. There's a multitude of things that I've prayed about and I don't understand and I can't comprehend it and I don't know how it's going to come out. But that doesn't mean I'm going to stay in bed because of it and not get up and do what God's called me to do. So they were, had an energized testimony and that energy and that testimony made them willing to move ahead even though they had questions with no answers. They were moved to action. And so I see not only that, but they were willing to be an example in all areas of their life. Uh, and uh, after the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power. If the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses. And he talks about Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, in all areas of their life. Every sphere of their life to where they had influence, uh, they were energized to be a testimony for the Lord. And then I see it's this matter of being energized, testimony, being willing to send the gospel around the world. First Thessalonians 1, we won't turn over there, but chapter 1 and verse 7 and 8, Paul commends the Thessalonians because of the fact that their testimony of salvation had spread all throughout Macedonia. And so I want, I want to have an energized testimony that literally uh, God is using me, will use me uh, to be able to preach the gospel around the world because of my life. I've just really been thinking a lot because there have been a lot of uh, uh, people in ministry that have been involved in ministry for many, many years, like Charles Stanley and different ones like that, Ron Hamilton, Frank Garlick, all these different ones that uh, they're in heaven now. And these last several months, there's been a lot of people that I know that I've respected and I've learned from and have had an impact on my life, they're in heaven now. And I thought of their life and their testimony was energized to the point of affecting and influencing people all around the world. What amazing thing is that God can take us and energize our testimony where we can impact people all around the world. And so an energized testimony. And then the last thought is this, a challenging witness that he gives them in verse nine, uh, nine. There's a glorious ascension. When he had spoken these things, what was that? Everything we just talked about. When he had spoken these things, uh, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud and received uh, him out of their sight. Glorious ascension. I, I often tr try to visualize what is going on in the Bible when I read these different events. And I, and I just, I, I stand amazed when I read verse 9, just thinking, here they're talking with Jesus. He's been giving them instruction. He's been with them for 40 days, and he's given them last-minute instructions before his uh, depart, departing from this life. And as they're sitting there, standing there talking with him, just all of a sudden he's received up in the heavens, up in the clouds. Now, what a glorious ascension there took place. And I just try to grasp in my mind uh, what were they feeling when they experienced that? I think of Enoch walked with God and he was not, for the Lord took him. I just wonder who was standing there when that happened. We often don't think about that, but I want to think. Here is Enoch walking along with God. He had to be on the face of this earth. Here he is walking along with God, having fellowship with God. I don't know who was around and who could have witnessed or seen what was going on, but all of a sudden he's gone. A glorious ascension, a challenging witness because of the fact when we realize 
that ultimately when we come to the end of our life, we're taking, being taken up into glory, a glorious ascension. An amazing response in verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Amazing uh, experience as they watch him uh, to be taken up. It says they uh, look steadfastly towards heaven. No, they were shocked. Can't believe they're, what they've seen. And then in verse 11, there's a positive hope that is given. Amen. Which also said, you men of Galilee, these are men in white apparel. Why stand ye gazing into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go up into heaven. That's a positive hope that we can give the people. Jesus Christ, we know this, there's a resurrection for us one day because Jesus arose, we too shall rise. Amen. But I may say, say this, because Jesus ascended into heaven, then we can ascend into heaven also. Right. Either we're going to ascend into heaven by closing our eyes in death and opening our eyes in glory, or by the trumpet sound of God and the rapture takes place and we'll be caught up into heaven. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, this world's going to be standing in shock, gazing up into heaven, trying to explain what in the world just took place. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus, before he ascends into heaven, gives some last minute instruction to his disciples. And I think it's good instruction for us. Don't forget what the work of God is. Remember the work. And uh, I think sometimes people forget that. Reveal a message. We have a message to give the people. And that's God's love for them and that Jesus died for them. Be assured of the promises of God. I've often said, uh, when you're going through a trial, find a promise from God in the book. And then hold on to it. Don't let it go. There's been many promises and situations I've found myself in as a Christian that I've literally had to find, grab a hold of the promise of God and not let go. And pray and pursue God and say, I don't know what is going on. I don't understand how to respond. But God, you promised this. And I'm holding on to the promise. And then be energized in your testimony. Now, don't be embarrassed about being excited about being a Christian. You know, it's amazing to me. Everybody's, uh, uh, nobody's embarrassed about being excited about a sports event or whatever it may be. Uh, people are excited about their uh, uh, their jobs and uh, things they can do. And, uh, you know, we get excited about all this different stuff. Uh, but why can't we just be energized and excited about being a Christian? Amen. You're a child of God. Amen. You're a child of the King. And I, I like old uh, Dr. Cook years ago. He always used to say when he was on the radio, walk with the king today and be a blessing. Amen. Every time he got to the end of his show, I was driving tractor and trailer, and I'd turn on the radio and I'd listen to him. Uh, walk with the king today and be a blessing. Hey, hey, we're the child of the king. Amen. So let's walk with the king and be a blessing. Amen. And then the challenging witnesses. We can be a witness and a testimony uh, to others about who Jesus Christ is and the many things that he does in our life. These are good instructions for us. Amen. I don't know about you, I need to remind myself about those things every once in a while because I have a tendency to forget literally what needs to be the priority in my life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together tonight. I'm thankful, Lord, that this morning we could consider Bible prophecy. I'm thankful, Lord, that these instructions that Jesus gave uh, were to impact the disciples' lives in the immediate experience they had and in the days that followed as they would uh, do the work of the ministry. And so, Lord, help us understand that you have a word for us right now in the days in which we live. But, God, you have a future that you want us to fulfill in doing the work of the ministry. And so help us to receive the parting words of Christ. And uh, Lord, follow them and live for the glory of God. Fill us with thy Holy Spirit. Give us the fire of God from heaven. And God will give you praise and glory for it all in Jesus' name.
Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing a song. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. If you're here tonight, you're not sure you're saved. Why don't you come? We'll show you from the Bible how to be saved. As a believer, maybe there's some of these things you forgot about. Or you say, well, I knew about it. I just haven't been too excited about it. Maybe you just need to come and talk to the Lord about that and get those things straight in your life. That God will give you the fire of the Holy Ghost of God. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Plus, there were people standing guard, so I couldn't touch anything. Um, but we got plenty, plenty of desserts and coffee over there. You know, the only thing that we're missing with all these desserts is someone's birthday to celebrate. Pastor's got a birthday coming up this week, so uh, why don't we wish them a happy birthday? Let's sing happy birthday to Pastor, and then I'm going to pray. Pastor, when we get ready to pray, you make your way over there first. Okay, just save a few things for us. Amen. <laughs> well, let's say happy birthday to our pastor. We love him and we really appreciate you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Pastor. Happy birthday to you. Pastor, we love you. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you for making way over. I'm going to pray. And then we can make our way over there. You don't have to wait. We're going to pray now. And there'll be two lines. Help yourself. There's coffee and other things. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the instruction in the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, your goodness to us. Lord, thank you that you equip us, Lord, for your service. And Lord, we're thankful for our pastor tonight, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would bless him in a mighty way. Protect him, his wife, Lord. Uh, Lord, we love him and appreciate him so much. Thank you for the stand on the Word of God. And Lord, thank you for all the years of instruction. Just pray that you continue to, Lord, just stir that fire in his heart. Help us, Lord, to grow in our own faith. And Lord, we love you. We pray that you would bless the food that we're about to eat. Thank you for those that have brought it, prepared it. And we pray that you would bless the fellowship this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can make your way over to the other side.